Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to help you lead more confidently and make a bigger difference, both professionally and personally. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's free weekly e-newsletter, Unleashing Your Remarkable Potential, which is full of articles and resources to help you become a more confident and successful leader. Sign up by going to remarkablepodcast.com forward slash newsletter. And now here's your host, Kevin. Hey, hey, welcome everybody. We're going to talk about burnout today, not burning out your tires, the burnout that you feel at work. And if you've ever felt it, you're in the right place. If you think that maybe it's happening to members of your team, you're in the right place. Or if you've heard this word and don't even really know what it exactly means, you are in the right place. I've been gone from Mondays live for a couple of weeks, but I'm glad to be back with you. And in just a second, I'm going to introduce our guest. But before I do that, uh, I want to welcome you back to another live episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. You can get all future live episodes and therefore interact with us and see them sooner because what I'm doing live with my guest today is going to be almost three months before it's on the actual podcast. So if you're hearing this on the podcast, you're already behind. And you can just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn or remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook. Take your pick and join us there. And now if you're here with us live, I want you to imagine you're joining us virtually for a cup of coffee. So share your questions, your comments, and your ideas because they will make for a better conversation for all of us and eventually a better podcast as well. So today's episode is brought to you by Remarkable Masterclasses each month. We release a new skill in an advanced form of masterclass designed to help you become the remarkable leader and human you were born to be. Details on how to get on board for a specific skill or to get discounts in each month can be found at remarkablemasterclass.com. I'll put that right there on the screen, remarkablemasterclass.com. Let me bring on my guest. Don't you think that's a good idea, everybody? Let me introduce you. Can Now you can see her here. Uh, I will get rid of that so you can see her name. Let me introduce... Uh, Miss Paula to you, if I can get my screen back up here. There we go. She, Paula Davis is the founder and CEO of the Stress and Resilience Institute, a training and consulting firm that partners with organizations to help them reduce burnout and build resistance at the team, leader, and organizational level. She left her law practice after seven years and then earned a master's degree in applied positive psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. As a part of her Postgraduate training. She was selected to be a part of the University of Pennsylvania faculty teaching and training resilience skills to soldiers as a part of the Army's Comprehensive Soldier and Family Fitness Program. In addition to her work with the military, she has worked with thousands of professionals, leaders, and teams in many industries, including many of the world's largest law firms, not surprisingly. Her expertise has been featured in and on the New York Times, the Oprah Magazine, the Washington Post, and many other publications. She's also a contributor to Forbes, Fast Company, and Psychology Today. She is the author of a brand new book, Beating Burnout at Work, Why Teams Hold the Secret to Well-Being and Resilience. And we all love a good secret. Paula, welcome. <laughs> so hey, glad that you're here. Kevin, thank you so much. And when you were uh, when you were welcoming your guests back uh, and you, you alluded to the other kind of burnout, I had to chuckle because I used to drag race way back in the day, um, just, just for funsies as a hobby. So... <laughs> Burnout. I know. I'm, I know both aspects. You know, well. So you have experienced multiple types of burnout. <laughs> I I'm have. Uh, I am so glad that you're here. And uh, again, for all of you that are joining us, if you're just just now joining us, if you have questions, you have comments, just share them. You know how to do that. You're on social media, for heaven's sakes. Just do that. Uh, but I want to get us started, Paula, by having you tell us. I mean, I told. I said something interesting about you in the introduction about that you were a lawyer and. I guess you're always a lawyer, but you're not a practicing attorney anymore. But just in general, I'm guessing when you were growing up, you didn't say, I'm going to write a book about burnout and resilience. So um, tell us a little bit about your journey, sort of what got you to this place. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I call myself a recovering lawyer. So that's I think that's that's what I that will always be in terms of in terms you of need to get that domain. One yes. of my co-authors owns the domain and uses recoveringengineer.com. You need to go get recovering lawyer. There we go. Okay, writing writing down a little note. Yep. Right there. there you go. All right. Go so, ahead. 
not only did I not think that I would grow up one day and write a book about burnout, I didn't even grow up and think that I was going to be a lawyer. And so um, happened to sort of stumble my way into the legal profession and practiced for seven years and burned out during what became the last year of my law practice. And I didn't know what burnout was. I kind of, if you would have made me define it, I could have maybe, you know, cobbled together some sort of definition for you. Um, but I didn't, I had no clue what it was and just really knew that I wasn't managing my stress or really dealing with the pressures of work in the same way that I thought I had been able to at different points in my career. And so there were really um, three big warning signs that I missed when I was going through this process. And so the first one was that I was chronically, physically, and emotionally exhausted. So like literally nothing that I did really helped to re-engage me, to fuel my tank. I spent a lot of time playing co-ed softball and hanging out with my friends. And I stopped doing a lot of those activities because I just wanted some bad reality television and the couch. And for people to just leave me alone because there was no sense of kind of recouping or recovery. Um, the second big warning sign that I missed is that I was chronically cynical. So everyone just started to annoy me and bug me. And that is so not my personality. And so um, especially my my clients, my, you know, my poor commercial real estate clients who would, you know, call me up and say, hey, you know, you got these problems. What do you want? <laughs> what do you want? Uh, and, you know, outwardly, I was always very professional, but inwardly, there was a lot of eye rolling going on. A lot of like, really, do you have to call me with this? Can you not figure this out yourself? You're not going to listen to my advice anyway. So why are we even having this conversation? And that led to a lot of um, lost impact and lack of confidence, not in my ability to be a good lawyer, but in my ability to really see a meaningful path for myself through the profession. I was really disconnected from the work that I was doing. It wasn't, I, I wasn't inherently seeing any sort of meaning or impact in the work that I was doing. And so it just caused me to start to think about, is there a plan B? Is there something else that maybe I should be doing? Um, I had always wanted to own a business, thought I would be doing that much later in life uh, as, you know, my way post legal uh, career. And it turned out that it turned out to be the right opportunity for me to explore that at that point. So you figured out that that wasn't working somehow, even though you started out by saying, I missed the warning signs. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll come back to those warning signs, I'm sure, mm -hmm. in just a second. Um I'm curious, you you went on to Penn to study in the applied positive psychology. Like, how did you make that jump? Because you're just describing to us exhausted, cynical, it seems like the exact opposite of someone who would want to do that. How did you end up there? Yeah, so that was a process. So this, this whole, and, and part of the reason why I think my burnout lasted as long as it did is because over that year that it really unfolded, um, I was trying to figure all of this out. I was trying to get my arms around, first of all, what was even happening um, should I stay in the legal profession? I talked to my boss eventually about some of what I was experiencing. I asked to be reassigned within the organization, within our legal team. That didn't work. I thought about going back to the law firm I had practiced at. Um, that didn't work for a whole host of reasons. And so there was a lot of figuring out that I was doing over this period of time. And so eventually, so actually first what I thought I was going to do is I was going to go be a pastry chef. So, um, cause I love to bake, so why not, right? And so you see for me, there started to be this theme of lack of intentionality. I went to law school just simply because I thought it would be a great extension for my education. Now I'm at this point and I'm trying to think, well, what do I love to do? Why don't I try this? And so um, ended up doing a week long pastry internship near a restaurant or at a restaurant near where my brother lived in San Francisco at the time. And literally within the first couple of hours of doing that, I knew I like I hated every minute of it. And I knew it was just like completely the wrong thing. Um, so then I had to really unwind that and, and think in a more intentional way about what do I really want to do? Because at, at this point in time, I'm in the middle of burning out. I'm not seeing yet how helping other people not burn out and educating companies and teams about well-being and resilience and all of that even factors into anything. I'm just trying to get myself out of a mess. And so I ended up hiring a coach and she had just finished, she was just finishing with the applied positive psychology program at Penn. And I said, what is that? That sounds amazing because my undergrad is in psychology. And she explained it to me and I thought, wow, like this, this area of psychology didn't exist when I was finishing my undergrad. This sounds great. This sounds perfect. I can see how there's got to be something there for me that I can 
at least it'll be a scientific, scientifically rigorous program that I can go through, come out and figure out then what, what's the best pathway to, to sort of use those tools and that knowledge to help other people. I mean, it was really as kind of general as that, but I knew right away that that was going to be the path for me and, and haven't looked back. Perfect. So you, you've hinted at something that I really want everyone to think about through the rest of our time together, whether you're with us live or listening to us later. And by the way, if you're with us live, you've got questions, ask them. We want to know them and we'll include them in as best we possibly can. Um, so, but the point is this, you were saying, hey, I was living it and now you're helping people with it. And I think everyone who's here as a leader, I, I want you to be, I want you to have both of those hats on. Right. Because Paula may be speaking to you and you're saying, then that's me. But you may also want to need to be or even are here because you want to think about your concerns about that for your team. So I'd like you to wear both hats for the rest of our time together. But we can't go any further, Paula, until you actually I mean, you wrote the book. So you need to define burnout for us. Yes. And I should say, before I get into the definition, um, I'm an open book when it comes to my story. So if anybody has questions about any aspect of my own story that I'm talking about, don't hesitate. I mean, please, I've been asked a lot of different types of questions. So, so in terms of defining burnout, I define burnout as the manifestation of chronic workplace stress. So a couple of those, a couple of words in that definition are really important. So chronic is one. So we don't usually just bop along and one day just go out of the blue. Wow, I think I'm burned out. It's usually something that's been happening over a period of time. Can I give you an exact time frame for what that is? No, because it's different for everybody, but it's over a period of time. Um, you've been experiencing kind of those three big warning signs that I, that I mentioned earlier. The other piece of the definition that's really important is workplace. And so the World Health Organization, when it updated its definition and, and thoughts about burnout in 2019, made clear to add a sentence that if we're talking about burnout, we're talking about like a workplace phenomenon. There's a workplace root associated with it on some level. And I think that's really important because one of the places where we go wrong when we're talking about burnout is that we apply the word almost at least now to everything. Any, any state of stressful feeling that we have, whether it's work or outside of work, we can sometimes say, yeah, I'm stressed or I'm burned out. And we use that term really loosely. And we forget even, that. Yeah. Even like as a throwaway word, like, well, I'm burned out watching Friends. I'm not going to watch Friends sure. anymore. Like we use it in all sorts of ways, right? Yes. yes, we do. And I think that's one of the things that I try to encourage folks to think about is expanding our vocabulary around what is it that we're actually feeling? Are we just overwhelmed? Are we exhausted? Um, Adam Grant had a phenomenal article in the New York Times a handful of weeks ago where he talked about languishing, that state where we're not thriving, but we're not quite at burnout. So it's sort of this middle, just blah kind of feeling. Um, and, and really thinking about what what word is it that I'm that I'm feeling because it may or may not be burnout. And for most people likely likely maybe isn't actually burnout. Well, you know, words are so important. I'm so glad that you shared that. But you also, you you mentioned two words in your definition that, that burnout is the manifestation of chronic workplace stress, but you didn't mention that last word, stress. So by, by, by your definition, it's the manifestation of stress. So it's not stress. So talk about the difference between so burnout and stress. Yes. So, and this this can be um, this can be a little nuanced, and and both stress and burnout exist on a spectrum. So, there's a whole range of places that you can be in between. So, it's important for people to recognize that um, when you say stress and you say burnout, you could mean a whole host of things within a range of possibilities. And so, we all deal with you know general everyday stress. The pandemic certainly has added a whole layer of different stressors to to folks. A lot of demands on our time and attention. And, and things like that, um, where you know you're leaving sort of the land of stress and getting into something that looks a little bit more like burnout is when you start to see those three big warning signs that I miss that I mentioned earlier. You're seeing more of that chronic physical and emotional exhaustion. You're saying, wow, like I, uh, the stuff that I used to be able to do, like I went, you know, I used to be able to go for a three mile run and blow off steam and that would help reset me. I'm doing that now and I'm just not seeing the same type of recovery. Um, the, 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 the strategies that you were using to deal with stress just aren't necessarily working as well. And so that chronic physical and emotional exhaustion just keeps coming up. Like I can't, 
somebody, one of my workshop participants called it the Sunday scaries. I remember like Sunday night staring at the clock, hoping to freeze time so I didn't have to go into work the next day because I just couldn't recover. I just didn't have that sense of energy to deal with work. So there's that piece, but really also paying attention to the sense of cynicism. That's a big one. And for a lot of people, that's their entry point into this burnout process. You just start to feel annoyed. You start to feel cranky. You're um, you're more reactionary to things. You're, you snap at people more. You're not as bubbly in terms of your personality compared to where you typically are. Um, you know, you're just more sour. You're more, you know, pessimistic about things. Um, so that all is within that cynicism piece. And then really also then start to pay attention to, are you just starting to have more questions about like, hmm, is this is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Is this meaningful work to me? Used to be five years ago, and now you know I'm just kind of doing the same thing over and over again. And so it's all three of those things that really are present if we're talking about true burnout. So that's how you know you've kind of made the shift or are making a shift into that that different area. Warning, warning, Will Robinson, or however that goes. Yeah. Uh, so. All right. So you mentioned the P word pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you and I are having this conversation live on uh, in early June. Um, people are going to be listening to this on the podcast sometime in September or beyond. So mm -hmm. we have to put that in context a little bit. But right now in June of 2021, what is the trend around burnout? You know, I mean, for everyone who said I'm there's new stressors from the pandemic, especially now as we're past the help getting past the health part of it. There's a lot of people saying there's been a lot of positives for me as well. What's mm -hmm. the overall trend around burnout from your research and what you know from others? So I think unquestionably what I'm hearing from people from from the vast majority of people is that this has taken a toll on them on some level, whether you would call it burnout or not. Again, kind of back to my earlier point. Right. I don't know, but I, I think there is for sure an, an increased heightened sense of I'm just over this. I'm tired. I'm I'm overwhelmed. I'm exhausted. I've been juggling so many so many balls that I'm I'm really just kind of over it. Uh, and then how that sort of plays out is different for everybody. You know, a lot of people are enjoying. Um, you know, the autonomy that they have now and the flexibility for, for working from home. Other people are saying, get me back to the office as soon as I can, because I need that space and I need that buffer, especially working parents who I talk to a lot. Um, you know, and so it plays out in a lot of different ways, but undeniably that sense of, you know, <laughs> I'm done. Like, like, you know, I just went 12 rounds and I'm, and I'm done. But one okay. of the big messages right that I think we really, really have to make sure that we're aware of is that the pandemic did not cause burnout. Burnout was a huge organizational and workplace problem prior to the pandemic. So I give a, a number of statistics in my book across industry around burnout rates and what we kind of know um, the burnout experience to be in, in different professions. And those are all pre-pandemic rates. So, you know, healthcare, the rates of burnout were um, exceeding 50% in a number of different specialties prior to the pandemic, you, we all know where healthcare, you know, ha, how, how they were front and center in all of this. And so, uh, you know, you add that to it and it certainly can accelerate it, but burnout then isn't also going to go away either when the pandemic ends. And I think that's really important to pay attention to. In fact, I actually think it's going to get worse in the immediate short term as we shift back to work, because so many people are anxious about what they're going to be facing. It's a brand new environment. We left what we all knew work to be, figured out how to do this completely new version of work. And now we're going back into the brave new world around a lot of unknowns and uncertainties. And that's exhausting again. for people. And a lot of people that I talk to every day, that don't want to go back that are in some cases yeah. being told you're going to go back and like, and there's the new anxieties around that. Like I, I have, I, I got, you know, the average American had a 27 minute commute each way before. And mm -hmm. now you're going to say I lost that hour back. I mean, it's all so, I agree with you hundred percent that, that, the you know, it, if the day comes that we get back to pre March, 2020, it's first of all, it's not going to look the same. And people aren't going to immediately be better. I, I agree with you 100% on that. Yeah. So, and 
yeah, well, I was just going to say, I think we have to, I think organizations really have to pay attention to this. And I, I hope a lot of them are because I think people are saying very strongly what they want and how they want their work orientation to be. And I've already worked with a team and an organization that is taking a very hard line stance to, we are, we have this culture where we expect everybody to be back in the office at a certain point. And they lost one of their top talents already who um, got a competing offer from another organization who said, that's all right, you can work from home two days a week. And, and the, be the last when they lose. No, and her and, and the organization said, you know, sorry, we can't match that because we are going to expect everybody to be back in five days a week. And so, you know, really paying attention to what your what your employees are saying is is extremely important. It's a, a, a talent differential differentiator now. We could have a big long conversation on that, Paula. But we don't have time for that. We got other stuff to talk about. One of the things when 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 your book was pitched to me, you know, just st stating it as it, it really mm -hmm. is, um, because I wasn't fortunate enough to know who you were without having uh, having that happen. The, the thing that immediately caught my eye. I mean, I liked the idea of the word burnout. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't like the idea of it, but the idea of having a talk conversation about it. But but it's the subtitle that I loved. It said, "Why teams." hold the secret. Uh, so why is it that teams are the secret to the solution? That should get everybody's ears perked up. Well, this has been sort of my, the, this is the end result of my own unfolding tenure aha moment around burnout, because one of the places that we go really wrong in this conversation is we tend to make burnout very very much about the individual, that it's an individual personality issue, stress management problem, self-care issue. And so we apply those types of strategies to the problem, and yet we still see this, this same level of problem and it's getting worse. So we're, we're missing the mark in some respect. And so that's really what was my going in position when I was recovering from burnout. My thought was, what did I, what the heck was that first of all? And what did I do wrong? And what memo did I miss and really put a lot of pressure and blame on myself. And over time, just through my own work and interviewing people and reading the research, there is all very, very clear that we have to start thinking about burnout as a systemic issue um, requiring holistic solutions. So burnout really is the manifestation, it's the individual manifestation of a workplace culture issue. And so what we've been doing is spotlighting the individual aspect, and that's still an important piece of the puzzle, but we now have to start broadening out the conversation. And so for me, I took a step back and thought, okay, if, if individual alone isn't the answer, I also can't walk into an organization and just tell them, hey, just we have to change your culture. Um, that's not going to work either. And so my thought was where where in the system is the best entry point? Where can we really start to influence and leverage some change here? Because this has to be doable or nobody's gonna do it and we're gonna sit here with the same problem for a long period of time. Right. And so for me, it was to me about teams because not everybody, but a lot of people work in some version or form of team at work. And it is really, I think of teams as sort of like little mini systems. So little mini systems within the big organizational system that if they're given the right tools to create the right type of environment that is could slow burnout down, that'd be great and could have ripple effects. And then we could just you know apply that to other teams in the organization. You know, I, I really like that a lot. And, and in the book, you talk about six ideas around the word primed, mm -hmm. around the acronym or acrostic of primed. And I don't, we don't have time to unpack all those things. Sure. But you mentioned the M, which is mental health. And that's where most of us go, right? Most people say, well, they need to work on their mental health. Or, and I, you also said something I think is really important is a lot of people basically blame themselves. Like, what did I, you said it, what did I do wrong? One of the things I like about the book is you help us get past that. Really, what I I, I want to talk about a couple of these in a second, but I'm still struck by the word secrets, uh, and maybe you want to talk about secrets in the in relationship to one or more of these uh, of these uh, pieces. Uh, but you know, give us a secret, give us something that might help us that we haven't even thought about before. Well, one of the things that was certainly an aha moment for me in terms of researching the book, there were a number of things, but one in particular was how strong our little um, micro moments of interaction are with each other. So I think when we think about creating a, the type of culture to do anything, but especially to slow burnout down, we immediately think it's got to be some sort of huge, big thing. I don't even know where to start. Therefore, I'm, I'm not going to do anything and we're going to just sort of, you know, 
sit here in the same kind of way. And so it's, it's small behaviors, little five to 10 minute interactions that you have with people. I call them tiny noticeable things. It's really these small things that matter when they're done consistently to really turn the turn the tide in terms of what we know burnout, what we know to slow burnout down. And so that was that was a big deal for me that it, there's really a lot of very doable behaviors that people are, are maybe even doing, but just don't realize intentionally that this is something that could be helping to create the type of culture that could slow burnout down. So that was a big one. That was really the, the first and foremost one. Tiny noticeable things. And since you're not reading it, you may not have noticed that that's, that is TNT. Yeah. Tiny noticeable things, one of the clever things that you did in the book and I, that I really like. Um, uh, you, you're, you're continuing to connect this, now that we're talking about teams, to organizational culture. And it's, it's really fascinating to me because what will be next week's podcast episode that I recorded earlier this morning mm -hmm. is about a, a new book called The Culture Puzzle. So for all of you that are listening to this on the podcast, if you... Uh, are listening when this first comes out, wait for next week. And if you're listening sometime later, make sure you watch uh, or listen to the next one about the culture puzzle, because I think there'll be a really nice connection between these two. Um, the P in primed is psychological safety. Yes. And so talk about that just a bit in the connection to how it, how it can be a solution for uh, or create reduction in burnout. So the psychological safety is just trust. It's essentially trust at the group level or the team level. And so I include it as a foundational element in the model because it, I have just discovered that it'll be harder to implement or talk about or sort of employ some of these other strategies if you can't, if you don't trust each other, if you don't have that team cohesion. And so starting there becomes really important. Um, and it's one, it's the, it is essentially the belief that you can show up to your team, you can show up to work as yourself that you can respectfully disagree, that you can push back, you can raise questions, you can pitch an innovative idea that maybe you haven't fully thought through. You can do all of those things without the fear that you're going to be singled out, embarrassed, penalized, you know, whispered about after the meeting. Um, and it creates just this, um, this sense that you then are more willing to share what you know, that you're willing to, and teams can eat more easily identify when mistakes or errors have happened before they become these huge issues. And it kicks open the door to belonging. So, you know, we're, we're having, you know, such intense conversations right now around diversity and equity and inclusion within organizations and, and psychological safety really helps to steer us toward that inclusion and belonging piece of the puzzle. And so, um, again, back to the TNT concept, I, I was, again, really struck at those small moments. It's those small moments of five to 10 minute interaction with each other where you're giving what what we call you matter cues to people or not that tends to help your team go in more of a direction of psychological safety and trust or erode psychological safety. And trust. Either feeding us or, or starving us, right? So yeah. someone, on, someone on LinkedIn shared this, and I'll just read it to you, let you comment as you wish. Mm -hmm. Teams who are, who are at the center of accountability more than others in a company are more prone to burnout. Evaluating and restructuring the company workload company-wide can help. You want to comment on that one way or the other? Paul? Yeah, reevaluating, restructuring the workload company-wide can help. I don't think I have worked with a team or an organization that doesn't, we don't have a workload conversation on some level. And it's important really for, for teams and for organizations to pay attention to that conversation because workload has been found to be one of the, I talk about the core six job demands that drive burnout. It's a big one. It's one of the, it's one of the core six. And, and when I have a chance to assess those different demands within teams, it is almost always number one or certainly an influencer in terms of whether or not burnout exists within, within the team that I'm talking to. And so um, what it unfortunately comes down to, though, is I think employees see it one way as, gosh, I wish the organization would just hire two or three or four or however many more people. And then the company says, yeah, but you know, you guys just, you gotta do more with less and you know, we, we don't have it in our budget and what have you, and we get this immediate tension right away. And so what I really help teams and organizations start to think about and leaders is broadening out the conversation. So yes, personnel is one aspect of workload, but it's also about how we communicate with each other. It's, it's the intensity of our communication. It's I'm expected to be emailing you at two in the morning on a Saturday and I don't want to. Um, it's are you taking advantage of all of the resources at your disposal? Do you even know what, what all of the resources are that you could be 
using at your disposal? Uh, you know, it's teaming. Are you teaming in the right way? You call yourself a team, but you know, is there some predictability with, you know, me being able to take a vacation potentially knowing that I have coverage so I'm not walking back to 800 emails? That's a big problem. And so it's, it's a whole lot of things that play into the workload conversation that I help teams start to talk about. Yeah, I know that you and I could, I mean, I've got 10 more things I could ask you yes. and we don't have time <laughs> for all that. But there's, but there's a question I think is really important. And if I'm a, if I'm a leader out there listening to this, if, if I were here live, this is the question I would ask. And that is okay. I'm a leader, and and I don't want I don't want my team members to be burnt out. From an interpersonal perspective, I don't want them to be burnt out because it's hurting the productivity. I mean, there's the productivity of the team and the organization. Like so, for all sorts of reasons, I don't want my team members to be burnt out. How do I diagnose this? Like, what can I be doing as a leader? Because some sometimes the leaders are burnt out. Sometimes the leaders are like impervious or perhaps just, you know, blissfully unaware sure. one way or another, they're not there. So they just assume, well, we're, we're good. We're good. How do, how do we diagnose this better? Be more aware. Yeah. And I like the awareness verbiage a little bit better than the diagnose verbiage um, because at the end of the day, we're not, we're not labeling that, you know, that's not like a condition. Fair. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Um, so, so how do we get at understanding if this is going on? And so one of the, so there are formal, formal, more formal assessments and measurement tools to talk about, you know, helping people understand where they are on the burnout spectrum, but they're proprietary and, you know, you take, they take work to access and things like that. And so I'm all for um, quick little spot checks, like giving folks, you know, an understanding, uh, little quizzes that leaders can take for themselves and then also give to their team in an anonymous way, just to start collecting some data, whether that's empirically based or not, to just understand what's going on. Um, when I give folks my resilient teams assessment, the question that is universally scored the lowest is we are good at recognizing signs of overload in our team members and doing something about it. So I think first and foremost, you have to understand what's going on um, to begin with. And it's just some basic questions. You can, um, you know, one of the quizzes that I use, um, I, I happen to find in Harvard Business Review, and I really like it. It's a, you know, scale of one to five. And just think back over the last week. How effective did you feel? How overwhelmed did you feel? How productive did you feel? And did you have any fun? And I think those four questions alone just help you sort through, give you some fantastic information that you can start to build on. So there's that. But I think that, you know, leaders also have to start, this, this comes back to really knowing your people and you have to really understand, um, you know, what is somebody like when they are thriving and engaged? And, and is that now, has that now changed? So for me, and I talked earlier about how burnout exists on a spectrum. When I first started burning out, it was way different than how it looked when I finished burning out. So I just, you know, was rolling into work 20 minutes later. I was going out for lunches less with people. I was spending less time with my business clients. You know, when our general counsel had holiday parties, I would roll in late and leave early. It was little things like that. I had my door closed a lot more frequently. I had less interaction with people because back to the cynicism piece, they were annoying me and I didn't want to interact with them as much. And so are you picking up on some of those cues with the people in whom you work? Are just people more snappy and upset and checked out? And um, are they saying things differently? So it's paying attention to all of that. And you don't, if somebody does that, you don't have to be alarmed that maybe they're burned out, but you should be inviting conversations then Right. Not just one on one, but with the team generally. I mean, it's one of the best ways to keep trust and cohesion in a virtual team is to talk about the different challenges that you're facing right now so that it's not assumed what people are going through. So so those two things generally, I think, will will help you start to pinpoint and pay attention to is like, am I noticing something different or people saying something different? Um, and so with the with the quiz and then just general behavioral observation, you can you can start to kind of, I think, pick up on, hmm, is there something else going on here that that we need to talk about? Well, hopefully, uh, as you've been watching or listening to us, you've gotten some good ideas and, and you are now more aware as a leader uh, than you were. And so what Paula just shared gives you some ideas. You get a lot more from the book, Beating Burnout at Work, Why Teams Hold the Secret to Well-Being and Resilience. And you said something a second ago that, I that I ask I always ask people, but maybe it's more appropriate to ask you than at any with any other guest ever. And that is Paula, 
What do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? Yes. What do you do for fun? So I am big into, you know, like exercise. That's my way to, to sort of blow off steam. So I love my morning runs. I do a lot of morning runs. Um, I have a five-year-old and so uh, she loves like swimming lessons and swimming. And so we're starting to get warm here in the Midwest. And so I love hanging out with her, do a lot with my friends still in terms of um, now, at least since things are starting to open up a little bit more, I've been enjoying some more live music outside and um, kind of getting back to some of those other, <laughs> other fun things that make life feel a little bit more, a little bit more normal and centered given the past year and a half. So Perfect. Let me put some feedback up here for you. It says, thank you for this conversation. I would love to hear your thoughts on the importance of the intersection of cultural background and company culture as it affects burnout. I was ready to shift into our final question away from that. But if you want to take that for a second, I'll let you do that. So where I tend to see company culture and cultural background really kind of come into play and into, in, into intersect is around the, the trust and the psychological safety aspects of the work that I do. Uh, and so I think that, um, you know, because there are so many little you matter cues that build psychological safety, like looking somebody in the eye, you know, smile, checking in on people, things like that. Those might not be culturally acceptable things to do everywhere. And so paying attention to the nuance of those small you, you matter cues and helping teams that have different types of cultural sensitivities and requirements recognize that there are other strategies and things that they can use to build trust at the team level, um, but that those types of things do come do come into play. And that's just for me where I tend to see it most vividly is in that in that type of discussion. Perfect. And the only question you knew I was going to ask you is this one. So, so Paula, what are you reading these days? So, so I'm just now having having written a book all last year and promoted it, you know, in the process of promoting the book, I'm just now starting to kind of get back into my own um, reading for pleasure kind of mode. And, and really, um, one of the books that I'm into, I haven't gotten all the way through it, but I can't recommend it enough is called A World Without Email. Uh, it's by Cal Newport. And he's one of my favorite um, business writers who really does a fantastic job of translating, um, you know, social and psychological science and just science generally into really um, interesting and profound ideas for businesses and for business people. And so, um, you know, I, that's a lot, that's a lofty title, a world without email. Um, but when you dig into it, you start to realize how the communication systems that we have designed to help us have good communication are probably getting in our way more than we would, more than we would wish. And so I, I recommend that book. And I am old enough to remember when we were able to conduct business uh, without email. So we'll leave it at that. So, hey, now the question you wanted me to ask all along, Kevin, where? Uh, tell me, ask me, where, where can we learn more about your work and connect with you? Where do you want to point people? Paula, I'll hold the book up again. Very good. Yeah, folks can go to my website, Stress And, which is spelled out, Stress And Resilience. Dot com And I have a brand new stress, uh, resilience and burnout prevention resource center with lots of free resources that will be an ongoing um, expanding center for folks to rely on. Stressandresilience.com. Now for all of you, I have a question for all of the rest of you. Paula's just about done. She can just sit there and smile now. Here's the question for all the rest of you. Now what? What are you going to do with this? Because if all you did was take it in and take no action, it won't do you much good. Whether this was really meant for you, whether you were listening to this for you or for your team, your organization, or the people that you work with or live with, regardless, what actions are you going to take? Are you noticing that you're a little more cynical? Are you noticing that you just can't quite get past the physical and mental exhaustion? Are you waiting for the clock to stop on Sunday night? What are the things, What are you listening for and noticing the cues and clues? Are you thinking about what you could be doing in terms of small things that could make a big difference in terms of your interactions with others that could feed them and help them move past or avoid some burnout. The question here is, what are you going to do? What action will you take? Because when you take action is when good things can happen. So Paula, thank you for being here. It was you such are, a pleasure to have you. You are so welcome, Kevin. I've so enjoyed my time talking with you and everyone about this important topic. All right. So let me let me just close by telling you all that if if you aren't watching us live, 
you could be. Uh, join the Facebook group, and then you can get inside information. You can get connected and stay in touch with what's going on and get access to these much sooner. Uh, you can do that by going to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn. We'll hope you'll do that. And we'll hope you'll come back for another episode next week right here on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We'll see you all then.